you what, if you don't know how to get excited, watch kids. Because they get excited. We got their front row and they're jumping. Jesus is alive, right? And so if you if you you don't know how to do it, we'll just watch them and they'll show you how. Right? We can learn from kids sometimes. Amen. You can be seated for just a moment. We're gonna go into a time of tithe and offering. We don't pass the plate as we used to do um, anymore, but of course there's many ways to give. Um, you can mail it in to 130 Depot Street. There's the drop box in the back and a drop box downstairs. And then, of course, there's the tithe.ly, the way to give. And um, Mark 12, 41 through 44, it says, Sitting across from the temple treasury, he watched how the crowd dropped money into the treasury. And many rich people were putting in large sums. And then a poor widow came and dropped in two tiny coins worth very little. Summoning his disciples, he said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. For they gave out of their surplus, but she gave out of her poverty and has given everything she had, all she had to live on. And we've been talking into, in our youth about giving in the right attitude and we give any offering. God looks at our hearts and I was telling them that you know, when you get your um, trick-or-treat candy and when you get your Easter candy and all that, and you lay it out and you've got all this plethora of candy, right? And so you always have your favorites. Mine are the Reese's eggs, right? So you've always got your favorites, and it's like, you know, you want to give the good stuff back to God. And so you've got your favorites, and it's like picking out all the good candies, like your top ones that you love, the Reese's, the, the Skittles, the, the sour things. I'm a candy girl, right? <laughs> so you pick out the good stuff, and then you give it back to God. Because he has given so much, and we're so blessed. Amen. Or you can pick out the ones that you don't like, that you're just going to throw away. The Whoppers, the caramel things, I don't like those, right? All the stuff that you don't like that you would have just given, gotten rid of. And you can offer that to God as well. There's a difference in the giving. There's a difference in the giving. God sees our hearts. He knows. So the, the lady, she gave only but a little. But she gave so much. Because it was her heart. So stand with me. We're gonna we're gonna go to the, the Lord in prayer and continue to worship. God, we thank you for who you are. God, I pray, Lord, that you would search our hearts, God. That you would know, Lord, that when we give of our offering, when we give of our time, God, that we would give it out of abundance because you deserve it. Because you deserve all the honor. You deserve all the glory. Everything we have, God, is, is just a product of what you have given us, God. Our talents, our abilities, our jobs, our health, our children, God. They are gifts from you that sometimes, God, we do not deserve. But you have given us grace and mercy. And God, we just we come today, God, just giving just a, a small portion back to you for everything that you have given us. And we give you praise, and we give you glory, and we give you all the honor. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. You may be seated for just a moment. It's always a privilege to come to the Lord's table when we do that today as we celebrate Easter together. The risen Lord and Savior it's interesting as he met with his disciples, they understood the Passover. They understood that back in the day that a lamb had to be slain for every family. And when they were in Egypt, that the, the doorpost had to be covered with the blood in order for the death angel to pass on by. But as they met there with Jesus, they did not understand that he was actually the Passover lamb himself. And so as he comes uh, to be with them, he begins to institute a new day. How many know that Easter is the significance that it's a new day? Amen? He's no longer in the grave. He's no longer on the cross. But he's risen. 
We're going to celebrate uh, communion to together today. Often the children are uh, not up here, but we're going to do that together. And then we'll dismiss them uh, a little bit later on. From 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 11, verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake of the bread. supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this as often as you do it in remembrance of me for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes let's partake of the cup as you're there at your seat we invite you to just take a, a moment or two and dwell upon what the Lord has done for you. We thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that you went to the cross for me, that you bore my sins, or that you made a way for me to have life everlasting, for me to join you there in heaven. Lord, we're so thankful, so blessed today give you honor, and praise, and glory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. We bless you. We magnify your name. We lift up you. You are our Passover lamb. We rejoice in you today. Thank you for your many blessings, Lord.
teaches kindergarten through grade five. Uh, if you'd like to, you can go with Miss Pam. She's standing right there in the middle of that aisle. So those kids that are ages kindergarten through fifth grade, you can be dismissed this morning. Praise the Lord. If you have your Bible with you this morning as they are exiting, we invite you to uh, grab that Bible. We're going to hold that up and just declare that this is the Word of God and that what we're about to hear has transformative uh, life in it. It will change you. You'll never be the same. Amen? Uh, would you just repeat after me? This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. Today I will be taught the Word of God. I boldly confess. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I will never be the same. I am about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the Word of God. I will never be the same. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Do you believe that this morning? Amen. All right. Praise the Lord. If you remain standing, I promise it won't be long. We're going to read the scripture together. I want to speak about risen with Christ this morning. Risen with Christ. We'll be in the book of Matthew chapter 27, <coughs> verses 45 through 50. And I just appreciate the word of God this morning. Uh, there is one word in this that I want to focus on. Uh, that I'll have you repeat uh, with me, if you would, and I appreciate uh, you helping me out this morning. Look at your neighbor and say, help that pastor preach. Help that pastor preach. What I mean by that, if you, uh, we're, we're Pentecostal, if you want to say amen or uh, praise the Lord during preaching, we invite you to do that. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think I usually preach faster if you do that. Uh, but don't get too carried away, right? <laughs> All right, Matthew 27, verses 45 through 50 says this. Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness. Can you say darkness? Over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? And some of those who stood there, when they heard that, said, The man is calling for Elijah. And immediately one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed, and offered it to him to drink. The rest said, Let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to him, come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated this morning. Yeah. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this word. We have already declared that it is your word, that it is life-changing and transformative. Lord, I simply ask now that you would bless me as the messenger. Lord, that the preacher would show up, Father, that uh, you would give me the utterance and the unctioning power of your Holy Spirit, that this might be a word of God for the people of God. And we give you praise for it, and everybody said, Amen. 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 You know, every Easter, pastors are tasked with the job of giving the Easter message. And I take that very seriously. This is uh, more than my 12th, uh, over 12 times that I have preached the message of the gospel. For the heart of the gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And every year as I uh, prepare for this, I get out my Bible and I begin to read all of the gospel accounts of the death, the burial, the resurrection. And I'm typically seeking the Lord and saying, show me something new. Show me something that will be a, a word for your people. Uh, something maybe that I've missed before. Uh, and as I did that this year, can, can I just be honest with you? I became a little frustrated because I didn't find something new in particular that I had not heard before. But the, the next day when I came in and I had done all of that studying, I began to pray. And the Lord simply uh, kind of checked me and said, 
You don't need anything new. Yeah. Right? Amen. For this is the timeless, powerful, rich truth of the gospel that Jesus came and he lived a sinless life that uh, because uh, of who he was that they persecuted him, that they crucified him and that he died and that he was buried and that he rose again. You see, the word of God is <laughs> sharp. It's powerful. It never returns void. And honestly, it doesn't need our help. It's that powerful. Amen? Amen. Yeah. It doesn't return void. And when the scriptures are preached, then God promises to us that uh, it will accomplish the purpose that he sent it to accomplish. Even through the foolishness of preaching, that people's lives would be changed and that they would be saved. So I looked at this scripture in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and there is one word which I had you to repeat with me, and it was darkness. Each one of these followers of Christ, each one of these gospel writers pointed out that it was dark, that it was a bad situation, that it was negative, that it was bleak, that uh, it seemed to have no hope. And, and, and I'm sure that is exactly the feelings and the what was going on inside of their heart and their mind as they uh, looked to see what is happening to the Savior. But I also believe that creation was reacting to what was happening to the Creator. Yeah. Amen. That uh, it was appalled what Jesus was subjected to. But many times today, we look at the cross in a different manner. We don't always see the darkness of the cross. I read a quote this past weekend, and it simply says this. In the 20th century, we have sanitized and ritualized the cross. What does that mean? Is that It means that we have somewhat like this picture, which is beautiful, and I'm thankful for it. My sister does a wonderful job of, of uh, creating these kinds of designs. And it is beautiful, but it is beautiful in respect that we understood, we understand now what happened at the cross. Amen? So we have a, a, a look backward into time to understand that the cross is beautiful for those who have accepted the message of the cross. But the cross in its day, thank you, Dwayne, was not an item of beauty. It was darkness. It was hopeless for everyone but Christ. It was dark. It was death. It was blood. It was pain. It was suffering. It was all of those things that inspired the writers to say that it was darkness over all of the earth. In the middle of the day, from the noon time hour until the third hour, until 3 p.m., darkness over the face of the earth. Dark because of what put him there, which was our sin. Dark because there is no hope without Jesus. Amen. Because there is no hope without the gospel message. It is bleak and it's really doomed if you don't hear the message of the cross and you don't accept that message and believe upon Jesus, then it is truly darkness upon the face of the earth. So Matthew and Mark and Luke all talk about uh, this darkness. So as I'm sitting there in my study, the Lord said, Look at what I did for you. Now, can, can I tell you that th this is hard? 
It's not, we're going to get to the resurrection, but we want to look at the cross. We want to see what he did for us. And even before going to the cross, the Bible describes the Garden of Gethsemane. There Jesus is stressed. He's in anguish. I believe not because, uh, maybe some because of his, what he knows he's going to go through physically, but more than that, that he is going to take upon himself the sin of the world. Amen. You see how I sanitized that statement? For it wasn't just the sin of the world. It was my sin. It was your sin. Each one of us. That's why he went to the cross. You, you see, we have a tendency to talk about and, and to speak of it as if it does not affect us, but it does. And here is Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. His own disciples cannot pray for even a little while with him. They keep falling asleep. How many can testify that if you get woken up in the middle of the night and you start to pray, you'll instantly fall asleep almost? <laughs> right? The human nature side of that. And Jesus is in such anguish that the Bible tells us that even uh, Jesus doesn't really want to go through this, but he says, nevertheless, Lord, let thy will be done and not mine. And he goes through a, 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 a reaction in his body that's called hematidrosis. And his sweat began to pool and blood began to come out with his sweat as well. Imagine that kind of stress, that kind of anguish, that kind of physical uh, 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 happening to you. That You see the cross and what Jesus experiences is not just physical but emotional and spiritual. Here's a man who had never sinned, never committed a crime, and he's arrested like a criminal. And one of his own disciples, one who he had chose, Judas. Now, Judas is infamous now, but when Jesus chose him, he, uh, he, Judas didn't know that he was going to betray Jesus. And here is Jesus, and and Judas comes and he's going to betray him. And the symbol of his betrayal is a kiss on the cheek. Yep. Imagine the hurt. Anybody ever had somebody hurt you? Yeah. I mean, just betrayal. It feels like uh, they, they, you don't understand how they could do you that way. And that's what we see with Judas. He's betrayed. And when those religious leaders come, they come with clubs and spears to take Jesus. Yeah. They bind him. They question him. They falsely accuse an innocent man. Truly, John was right when he said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. His disciples fled. Peter denied him. Denied him. And now he stands before Pilate. And Pilate finds him innocent. Yet he turns him over to be crucified. An innocent man. It doesn't feel right, does it? Something wrong uh, when an innocent man is treated in this way. But to add to this, instead of Pilate was going to allow them to choose someone to go free, instead of Jesus being chosen, it's Barabbas. A man who was an insurrectionist against the Roman government. A man who, the Bible tells us, if you look deeply, was a murderer, was a thief. And they let him go free. And Jesus was cursed to go to the cross. The injustice, of the, the humanity cries out, something is wrong. Yeah. But yet God's justice demanded this perfect, sinless sacrifice. 
Then the Bible tells us that Jesus was flogged. Anybody ever been around some chickens on a farm? Chickens will flog you. They will fly over the top of your head. They will stick those uh, claws. Uh, they'll scratch you. They'll, do, they'll peck you. My daughter's loving this because she, she loves birds. I'm kidding. Uh, but that's not the picture that we get with Jesus. What we see is that Jesus was stripped totally naked. That he was whipped with what was called a cat of nine tails. And they tied Jesus to a post. And they used this whip, which had bone and metal and all kinds of sharp fragments in it. And how many have seen the Passion? And the Passion does a wonderful job of depicting the horror of this, but even yet, most of the time it was not one soldier whipping with this cat of nine tails, but two. One on each side that would flail this whip and beat it across the back of Jesus. And as they did, they would catch those uh, sharp things in his back and pull chunks of skin, flesh from his body. I know it's graphic. I know, I know, but we need to understand what he did for us. And he's bleeding. Bone would have been many times exposed, sometimes internal organs, as he's whipped repeatedly. Some of them would die just from this process. But Jesus made it through it. He went on to the crucifixion. There the Roman soldiers put a scarlet robe upon his back. Imagine, we, we think of that, oh, that must have been felt good to Jesus to have something on when he had been naked before, but no, the bleeding of, of his back, the, scar, the, the torment that had happened to him, now the blood is in the scarlet robe and pressed upon him. And they bow before him, mocking him. And they place a crown of thorns upon his head. Bible Ken made this. <clears throat> Don't come up here and grab a hold of it. It's, it's the real deal, okay? And they placed that upon his head. And they crushed it down upon his head. And then they took the staff that they had given to him. So that they could mock him as if he was a king with a staff. And they began to beat his head with that staff down upon that crown of thorns upon his head. Such pain, such torture as they cry out to him, Hail King of the Jews. And if that wasn't bad enough, now they take him with the scarlet robe upon his back. And they parade him through town. The longest route possible to humiliate him, but also to show other people who were troublemakers. That's what they thought Jesus was. To show other troublemakers that if you mess with, with Rome, this is the punishment that will happen. So Jesus humiliated there, he cannot even carry his own cross. This beam that weighs 75 to 100 pounds, he's just carrying the crossbar, cannot even uh, carry that because he's so weak and lack of blood, loss of blood, the torment, the pain. And they find a man to carry it for him. And they march him to Golgotha. And there the soldiers strip away that scarlet robe and reopen the wounds that were upon his back. Yep. And they put him, they lay him upon the cross, which was not polished and varnished, but rough wood. 
And there they nail him to that cross. They put a spike between his wrist and they nail him to that cross, arms spread apart. And as I read and studied this, uh, the Romans had made a, an art or a mastery of this uh, torture. And they would put it in just the right place that would touch the radial ulna nerve and send shock waves of pain all throughout his body. Imagine that. They pierce his feet with the same kind of spike. So as he's there, because of all of the anguish that he's going through, it makes it difficult to breathe. Yep. Hanging there. And what he must do is pull himself up. Pull himself up on that spike. Pull himself up. Push himself off of his uh, feet in order to be able to gasp and to take a breath. It didn't usually take long for people to die from that. You see, the cross was extreme torture. Designed to produce a very slow death with the maximum pain. And he hung there, more than likely, for about six hours. Imagine. And, and all of that is horrific. All of that, uh, as we look at that, we, we have a hard time uh, understanding and grasping the magnitude of what Jesus did for us. But the Bible tells us that he did it willingly. Yes. Wow. They didn't take him. They didn't force him. He went willingly to the cross yep. for you and I. Amen. The Bible tells us he could have uh, taken, he could have asked the Father and 12 legions of angels would have taken him from that cross, but he did not do it. He willingly went to the cross for us. Willingly, he goes there and he suffers the pain and the torment that was for our sins. John 10, 17, 18 tells us, Therefore my Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it again. Amen. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. Amen. This command I have received from my Father. Paul goes on later in 2 uh, Corinthians to say this about what Jesus did for us. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. When you think about that, not only on the cross was he willing, and did he live, and did he die for us, but his whole life was a sacrifice. For us. No wonder the gospel writer said it was dark. It was dark. Seemed hopeless. And I'm thankful for the cross. I'm thankful that he paid the price and I didn't have to. I'm thankful that he willingly went and was not us, didn't uh, deny that he would go, but I can't imagine it. Look at this. Pretty pot of tulips. You may have some like these in your flower garden. What beauty. Green. Flowering. Speaks of life. But what we don't see is what's buried. Come on, help me. I'm going somewhere with this. What we don't see is what's below ground. What we don't see is the darkness that this stems from. 
Let's see, thank you, Kelly. You did this for me. You see this bulb? That's below ground. And until it goes through a process of dying out in the winter time, but coming back to life in the spring, it's simply there. Yes. You cannot see the beauty yes. that will come from it. Come on, help me out. You cannot see the glory and the majesty that will come from what is buried. But that's the picture of what Jesus has done for us. Look at the root structure. Look uh, at the life that stemmed from something that was once looked like it was dead. Can I tell you that Jesus was dead? Didn't just look like he was dead. And from that stems life for you and for me. Because we were dead in our trespasses and sins. It was hopeless without him. But he carried the burden of our sin. And he buried them in the grave. <laughs> Aren't you glad your sins have been separated from you if you know the Lord Jesus Christ? And on that third day, he rose, he rose up from that Hallelujah. grave. And it's glory, and it's majesty, and it's beauty, and it's a change, and life comes stemming up out of that garden tomb because he has set each one of us free. All from the darkness of our sin. Of glory. What majesty. Who could think of anything like this but the Father? If we go back to the cross, there Jesus, when he is dying, he says these last three words, it is finished. <coughs> Three words in the English, one word in the Greek. It is finished. Notice he didn't say, I am finished, I'm done, it's over. He said, it is finished. The work that he came to do is the Greek word to telestai. And it means paid in full. Woo. Did you feel that in your spirit? All of the debt, all of the sin that I could not pay for, all the darkness, all the bleakness that I could not escape, yet he paid it in full for me. It's paid for. Look at your neighbor and say, it's paid for. Paid in full. What a glorious, glorious day. He's been crucified. But Christ is risen. And because he lives, we shall live also. <laughs> That's the good news of Easter. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed, but so are we who know him and identify with his death, burial, and resurrection. We have been raised to life with Christ. I remember getting saved at seven years old. I don't even know what seven-year-olds repent of, honestly. I mean, was, but there was a burden on my heart. My mom was the, was the children's leader. And I don't know what she said, but there was a burden on my heart. I knew that I needed forgiveness of my sin. And I simply kneeled down at that little chair, along with many others. And I asked the Lord to forgive me of my sin and to come into my heart. And at seven, there was a freedom and a joy. Isn't God good? Look at your neighbor and say, we're risen with